Welcome to APC webinar series. I'm Sean Lee, APC Sports Manager. Um, hope everyone is having a great and safe day today. Um, good to see you all from uh, NPCs and national federations and university and local organizing committee. Uh, for today, uh, as you know, this session will give you an understanding of uh, world para swimming including structure, what to do, and resources. Also, we will touch upon a brief overview of a classification. For that, we are very happy to have um, Suzanne here with us. Um, Suzanne is the um, head of technical control and officiating on the World Para Swimming Sports Technical Committee. And she has been involved heavily in para swimming since the early 90s as both a technical officials and technical delegates. She was a TD for London and Rio. Now she is also TD for Tokyo. In addition, she has attended Asian Para Games and Asian Youth Para Games. So without further ado, let me hand the microphone over to Susan. Floor is now yours, Susan, please. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon and good evening. It's really great that we've got this opportunity to introduce World Power Swimming to some of you who may be new to the sport as a refresher for those of you who've been involved with World Power Swimming over the years. I'm going to, fingers crossed, hope my technology works and see if I can share my screen now. So today we're just going to have a brief overview of what World Power Swimming is. We're going to look at the structure what it actually does and resources that are available to NPCs, coaches or athletes. As Sean said, just a, a mini brief overview of swimmer classification. Those of you who know me, I'm a technical official and come very much from the technical side. I'm not involved in classification. I have obviously some knowledge of classification through the sport, but by no means am I an expert in classification. So about the sport, swimming was one of the first sports at the original Paralympics of Games in 1960, held in Rome, and it's been on the programme ever since. Because we are part of the IPC, it doesn't necessarily automatically mean we are part of the Games, though. We still have to bid to be included in the Games and go through the process as all the individual sports do. The last Games in Rio... We had 593 swimmers competing from 79 countries, which was our set second highest total of NPCs competing at the Games. And they were competing for 152 medals. This number has increased for Tokyo. Obviously, at this point, we would have said what the Tokyo results could have been. But as we're all aware, we're still waiting for that one in anticipation next year. World Para Swimming is committed to ensure swimming re remains on the Paralympic program. Apart from para athletics, para swimming is the largest sport and it's one of the few that covers all three impairment groups. And by that I mean physically impaired, visually impaired, and intellectually impaired. And we have a whole range of athletes that compete in swimming. We currently have over 100 nations that regularly practice swimming and are part of our World Para Swimming family. We do regional championships throughout the world in each of the regions, and we hold world championships every two years. In September 2019, the last world championships were held in London, and we had 70 nations there competing with 580 athletes competing for 172 medals. Sorry, somebody's at the door. World Para Swimming is the, it's the governing body for worldwide para swimming. It's governed through the IPC Swimming, the World Para Swimming Technical Committee, who I'm part of, and the World Para Swimming Office staff. We have 10 umbrella sports within the IPC, five of those winter sports and five of those being summer sports. 
World Power Swimming is led by the staff team who work at the office and they work closely with myself as part of the Sport Technical Committee team. Our missions, values and vision. We provide a platform for para swimmers to regularly practice and showcase their ability to fulfill their potential and reach their sporting pinnacle and their dreams. So from grassroots development level, all the way up to the top Paralympic Games, we want uh, opportunities so athletes can show what they can do and achieve their full potential. We organize competitions as part of a calendar. We have a four year calendar process. So we have competitions regularly held over those four years which encourage participation of athletes and development of athletes and NPCs at all levels, promoting the core values of the Paralympic movement as they develop. How we administer the sport. World Para Swimming, which is based in Bonn, Germany, included as part of the IPC. We look at sport development. One of the recent projects that we've done was an Ajitas funded program in Africa. We went in to Africa, actually into Nigeria, and we did some classification opportunities, some coach education, and we held a competition after we classified those athletes. So we did coach development, athlete development, and officiating development through the competition. We do swimmer classification, and we obviously are the management structure for most of the major competitions working very closely with LOCs, local organizing committees. We train and accredit classifiers and officials. At our level, we're looking at international officials for those, but we also assist national federations with the training and accreditation of their own host country classifiers and officials, which starts them on that pathway to hopefully becoming World Para Swimming accredited officials. And um, we've started coach education projects. About two years ago, we started our first one and we have a group of mentor coaches now who can go and help support newly developing coaches and give them some expertise. One of the projects we're working on is trying to get a coach education handbook. So we've got different drills and ideas and things that we can send out and disseminate to new coaches coming into the sport. And obviously as the IPC, we hold and maintain the world regional records and the rankings databases that can be used for qualifying standards and all the rest of it. We are a resource for MPCs to ask us, we help them with competition running, any of the aspects that way with classification matters, and obviously we could help fund some projects if they're within our remit or get them in touch with Ajitas who may be able to help. We have various resources. Some of those are on our website. Some of those are available just by talking to the office. So the office is the key point of contact for all of that. Rankings and records are available freely for anybody to download. We have individual events, forthcoming events have their own web page. So anybody can look at what events are coming up and it has all the qualification information on there. We host the classification database so anybody can have a look at the current classification status of an athlete and education opportunities for both technical officials and classifiers and additionally news. So anything that is developing and it's coming out, goes on our news page so that everybody can see what's actually happening. For para swimming rules, we want to provide competitions that give athletes a fair and true picture of their abilities. They compete in both individual and relay events. And as I said earlier, all our competitions are open for physical, visual and intellectually impaired athletes. So one of the few sports that caters for all three impairment groups. We do follow similar rules as FINA, which is our Olympic counterpart, but obviously modifications do need to be made for those rules. And we make those to make sure that our athletes compete fairly. 
and equitably within themselves. All athletes who want to compete at World Para Swimming events must be classified, ideally at an international level, but for some competitions, we do have athletes that are only classified at a national level too. We have different ranges of World Para Swimming competitions. Obviously, the pinnacle of all our games are the IPC Games, which are the Paralympic Games themselves, or the Pan, Para Pan American Games. We have IPC competitions, which are obviously, as they say, still run by the IPC with an LOC assisting to actually deliver the games. And they are our World Para Swimming Championships, so our World Championships and our Regional Championships. And then we also have sanctioned competitions, which are our World Cup series and our World Series. We currently are running eight of those most years. Obviously, COVID has affected all of us this year in numerous ways. And this year, we've only managed to run one of our World Series and the rest of them sadly have been cancelled. And then any other international competition such as youth games or IOSD games come under our sanctioned limits. And then approved competitions could be held by anybody. And by seeking approval from World Para Swimming, it means your records will be ratified and the timings can go within rankings for your athletes. So lots of our national federations at their home country competitions seek approval from World Para Swimming to have those included than within any of the ranking systems. So for new athletes or new countries, how can we get in, involved with para swimming? Lots of our local open competitions. I work equally able-bodied swimming and para swimming. Lots of our local able-bodied open competitions have para swimmers now competing within them on an inclusive format. Again, your state, your regional, your county competitions, national competitions, area regional competitions, such as the Asian Para Games, and then major international competitions, such as the World Series Paralympic Games. So there's a kind of level and a structure that you can go through as you develop as an athlete or as an MPC that you can take your athletes to. Most athletes compete as part of a team, as part of a, an MPC, but we do have some athletes who travel to our competitions, still compete under the banner of their MPC, but it would just be an individual athlete attending those. Most teams though come with a full range of athletes, a team manager, some coaches, support staff along with their athletes. And we have a definition of what a support staff is, and that's any person de designated by the MPC or the National Federation to assist that athlete with logistical, so for visually impaired or directional instructions. So if they can't get into the water or get out on their own, then they would have support staff. Classification, the one that is the foundation of our sport Classification is there purely to ensure competition is fair and equal. All Paralympic sports, and my personal view is all sports to an extent, have a system in place that ensures winning is determined by skill, fitness, power, endurance, tactical ability and mental focus. The same factors that account for sporting able-bodied athletes. When I say most sports, to me, boxing in able-bodied, the smallest athletes don't compete against the 22 stone heavyweights. Yes, it's a different class system for that, but it's still a form of classification. So it, at its various bones, classification is all about making sure competitors compete against somebody who is equal in ability to them or of a similar range of ability to them. We call this process classification and its purpose is to minimize the impact of the activity limitation on the sport that the athlete's competing in. To be eligible for classification, athletes must have an eligible impairment 
that does differ per sport quite clearly and the impairment must be severe enough to cause an activity limitation in our case in the sport of para swimming. Classifications not exclusively found for Paralympic sports. Some are also found in able-bodied sport. For example, the weight categories in boxing or judo ensure the athletes of a similar stature compete against each other. Gender or age are further examples of classification. FINA have masters where the 35 to 39 year olds compete against each other the 40 to 44 year olds compete against each other. So it's a, a different kind of classification. But put simply, it's purely a way to group swimmers with like abilities for the purpose of being able to compete together on a fair playing field. So we've spoken that we have three classification systems. Athletes with a physical impairment, we call that our PI, physical impairment system. We have 10 classes within that from class one to 10. Sport class one is our most impaired athletes up to sport class 10, which are our least impaired athletes. Athletes with a visual impairment, our VI structure, three classes there. Sport class 11, our most impaired. They will technically be classed as legally blind, even though they may have some peripheral or colour contrast vision, up to class 13, which are least impaired athletes. And athletes with an intellectual impairment, are II athletes, a single class for those, sport class 14. So further details on the sports class profiles and all our classification rules can be found on the website. They're all there along with each of the athlete's classification status as well. So it's all open and transparent and therefore viewing. So classification is completed by a panel of classifiers, a medical classifier and a technical classifier. And at the end of classification, swimmers are assigned either a sports class for S, SB, SM, or hopefully not, but some occasionally do, they become not eligible. So S strokes cover freestyle, backstroke, butterfly. SB covers breaststroke only. And SM is for the individual medley, which is made up of all four strokes or three of the strokes for our lower class athletes. And within those, we have S1 to 10 for PI for the S strokes, 11 to 13 for the VIs for the S strokes and the 14s for the II. SB has only classes one to nine for the PI and that's because breaststroke is very heavily leg dominated and the categories then on a leg weighting I mean there's only a range of nine classes rather than the 10 that we have for all the other strokes. So when an athlete starts competing at their first competition, they'll undergo the athlete evaluation. It's conducted, as I said, by the classification panel. They're all authorized by World Power Swimming to determine what the sport class of that is. It takes a two-stage process the verification of the impairment is done beforehand. So each MPC National Federation has to submit medical evidence when they're applying for classification. And that is then verified to make sure there is an eligible impairment before the athlete is called for classification. On the day of classification, physical and technical assessments are carried out to determine the degree of the activity limitation for that athlete. The classifiers will then allocate a sports class, either S1 to S10 and a sport class status. That means the athlete has a confirmed class, review class with a date. So somebody who is a young athlete will need to be seen more often until they mature and their body has fully developed so they will have 
potentially a review in two years or in four years. So they'll get a review with a sports class. And athletes coming into the sport have the sport class N for new. So we know who's that. And then some athletes are observed in competition as well. So they then may have to enter events that they particularly don't want to swim on the programme just so that they can get their classifications confirmed. During the technical assessment, the technical classifiers who are mainly coaches will identify anything that possibly could be a rule infraction. And if it's something that the athlete cannot help doing, so if the rule says the athlete has to touch with two hands, but an athlete only has one arm, then the athlete will be allocated a code of exception, which says that they have a one arm touch. It does, it's not there to do to allocate codes of exceptions for an athlete that just doesn't do the stroke very well at this point. It's there purely to enable those athletes who cannot do something themselves. A pictorial part of the athlete evaluation, the physical assessment, which is done by the medical classifier, the technical assessment, which is done by the technical classifier, and then should they need it, the observation and assessment part. I would say probably 10 to 15% of athletes classified have the observational assessment element put to them during competition. So it's not a huge number of athletes that need that. So looking a little bit more in depth at the physical impairment classification system, there are 10 sports classes for athletes with the physical impairment, the lower, lower number indicating the more severe activity limitation than the higher number, which is the least severe activity limitation. Athletes with different impairments are seen to compete, and that's just based on how it impacts their sport performance. So you could have an athlete with a lower limb, impairment competing against an athlete with an upper limb impairment but it is all based on how that impacts their performance for the particular sport. The PI system is sport specific it's because the given impairment could have a different impact in one sport to another so a below arm amputation on a swimming stroke has a really large difference whereas has, would have a limited effect on an athlete who was in a running race. So it has to be very much sport specific and based on the sport that an athlete's doing. Our visual classification system is a medical based system. It's looking at actual, the, the pure sight from a medical based system. And it's done by ophthalmologists who are obviously medically qualified ophthalmologists and it uses a set of criteria based on visual acuity, visual of fields. We don't do any observational assessment for these because it's a purely medical based system. So our S11s have complete or nearly complete loss of sight. As I said, they're technically classed as legally blind. Our S12 athletes are a mid range of that spectrum and our S13 athletes have the minimum eligible visual impairment. Athletes in sport class 11 compete with black and goggles. So their goggles will be opaque or black. It's up to the athlete whether they are actually black, but they just need to be opaque so no light comes through them unless they wear prosthetic eyes, obviously, in both eyes that is. And they have to have a tapper who will indicate to the swimmer at both ends of the pool when they're coming into the turn or the finish. And that's there as a very much of a safety measure for the athletes. Our athletes can pick up quite a lot of speed as they're swimming and what they don't want to be doing is hitting into the pool end. So they have to have a tapper if they're an S11. We are in the process of reviewing the VI classification system, we've had ongoing research for the last five or six years, and they're coming to an end now. 
So there are potentially in the future will be changes to the VI classification system. But until the research is complete, obviously we can't say where that's going at this point in time. Uh, intellectual impairment classification system. They compete in a single class, which is our sport class 14. To qualify for the II classification system, athletes have to have a recognized intellectual impairment as defined by INUS and IPC World Para Swimming and have an IQ of 75 or lower and limitations in their behavior, which were diagnosed before the age of 18. So sadly, at this point, intellectually impaired athletes, it has to have come into effect before they're 18. Having a, an accident later in life would not allow you to go and compete in the II classification system. You see some athletes that have a physical context to their impairment, but it isn't enough for them to be placed within the physical impairment system. Their eligible loss is not great enough. So they then compete within the II because they make up this portion of the population for us. S14 swimmers officiate under FINA rules near enough because there are no rule exceptions under the World Power Swimming rules for our II athletes. So they still compete to our rules, but there are no exceptions. So they're actually realistically competing against the, the normal FINA Olympic style rules. Does anybody have any questions so far? I'm gonna read the question or it's from um, Haider. IPC WPS held Asian Para Swimming Championship in the future. We need like this championship approved by IPC WPS and it may be can a qualification championship to Paralympic Games held like this tournament in Asian region will be easy for participating, limit uh, financial problems and visa procedures. Yes, we certainly are holding Asian Para Games and Asian Youth Para Games in the future. If I remember rightly, and I, I must admit I haven't checked, I think we have a host in place for 23 and the bids are out for the forthcoming games in the future. But I'm sure, Sean, you can tell me if I'm wrong on that one. Uh, yeah, I mean... You know, the Asian uh, Para Games uh, is always uh, play as the um, qualification um, process for the, um, the Paralympic Games, which means if uh, you receive any uh, ranking point or any, um, you know, achieve the um, MQS, that you can use that result to proceed to the um, uh, Paralympic Games. So, for, uh, in this in this case, um, Asian Para Games is also the Asian Championship that uh, offer the um, qualification for the um, Paralympic Games. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Heidi? So please make sure um, take part in. Uh, next Asian per game, which will be uh, in Hangzhou, China, 2022. Uh, next question from Mohammed. How is the um, short stature eligibility? Okay, Mohammed, I'm not a classifier, but they are listed within our classification guide, which is available on the website. If you don't understand that or want any further questions if you'd like to email that into the office they would be able to answer you uh the last question from the local organizing committee of um, 2022 asian para games what is the difference between sanctioned competition and approved competitions the sanctioned ones are major ipc competitions and the contract holder is the ipc whereas approved competitions are competitions put on by the LOCs and IPC World Para Swimming just approve those and say that the facility 
meets our requirements and that the rules have been upheld. So it's a smaller opportunity in a way that athletes can get included for MQSs and go on the rankings and achieve records. So sanctioned competitions are a more higher tier and have a lot more input from IPC working alongside the LOC. Uh, I have a question. Um, can you just generally introduce the policies about um, the entry for the um, uh, world para swimming uh, in the in the Asian in the Asian Paralympic Games? Like for um, for example, like for um, each NPCs, um, like for every like national Paralympic com community community, like um, how many like players? Can, can just join the, the games or like diff, for different events? Yep, I can give you, I can't give you the specific answers, but I can give you an overview for each game. So the Asian Para Games, the Asian Youth Games, the Paralympic Games and such like, we have event qualification documentation that goes with that, which clearly says, how many athletes can compete in individual events, how big the team size can be, so the limit on the number of athletes. Some events that will split that between how many male athletes and how many female athletes you get. And there are also two potential questions. An athlete might have to meet an MQS, which is a minimum qualifying standards or they may have to meet an MET, which is a minimum equivalent time, which is a lower standard. So some qualifications say, if you get one MET, you can enter other events with an MET. Sorry, one MQS, you can enter other events with an MET. I can't give you the numbers because for each championships, those are different and based on the capacity the, the LOC has along with the facilities, but all our World Para Swimming competitions working with our LOCs have a complete package of event qualification guides, which really do detail. You can have 22 male athletes, 15 female athletes. These are the events they can compete in. And these are the individual time limits those athletes have to achieve to be able to enter those events. Those packages are normally produced 18 months, two years before the actual event. So for Gungzhou, I'm expecting they are out. It's not a competition I'm involved with this time for Gungzhou in 22. So I haven't looked at their qualification standards, but I'm presuming they're already out because the athletes then have a lead in time to compete in competitions so that they can make sure they get those times to enter into the bigger events. Does that help? Um, no worries. Just, just adding one point to um, Suzanne that um, I am working uh, with a world para swimming for now to develop the um, qualification detail, not only for the uh, para swimming, but for all sports for uh, Hangzhou 2022 uh, Asian Para Games. So soon I will be able to update you. Uh, so yeah, you will see the details, the how many uh, athletes uh, could be sent by uh, each NPCs. Uh, okay. Well, uh, there are more questions we uh, received. I, I guess it's uh, from Timo Les. Um, Parasuming sport structure or development. Could you please tell us should national parasuming under control of APC, NPCs or national swimming federation or should be stand as independent national body parasuming sports? We would like to get your advice so that we can do better for the athlete national selection. Yep, thank you. That's a really good question. We have within our hundred nations that widely practice world swimming, 
we have a mix. So some are independent federations, so they act as their own para swimming federation within their country. Some have really good connections with their able-bodied federations, so come within that national federation structure. And some are fully integrated, so the able-bodied and the para side act as one organization. I wouldn't want to recommend most definitely what is the best structure for you. I think it depends on the links you have with your able-bodied federation, but it's certainly something the office, as in the World Power Swimming Office in Germany, would be able to help you have a look at the options available to you and be able to talk you and support you through that process if that's what you would like. But I think it would be up to you to decide which of the structures is best suited to help you and your athletes, but we certainly at the office would be able to help you and support you in that process. Uh, next question from Nafa Ali. What if the um, swimmers can reach the uh, MET numbers? Would the country still get the opportunity in participation? If they've only reached an MET and not an MQS, probably not. It depends what the qualification guidelines though say. Most qualification guidelines say a minimum of one MQS before an MET comes into play, but it would depend very much on the individual event. Thank you very much, Sujan, for your great and comprehensive pre um, presentation. I'm sure that this was an opportunity for everyone to have better understanding and knowledge of um, para swimming. I guess uh, this um, concludes today's session. So hope to see uh, all of you again in the um, next webinars. And until that, stay safe and healthy and have a nice day. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye.